Good evening. I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel tonight, Nanette Asimov, staff writer with the San Francisco Chronicle, on UC Berkeley's review of its response to last year's student protests. Amy Stanton, reporter for KQED's Quest series on the danger of methyl iodide used in growing strawberries. And starting with Jess, Jesse McKinley, who is the San Francisco bureau chief for the New York Times. You covered the trial where Judge uh, Vaughn uh, asked them, Vaughn Walker, asked the two sides to submit answers to questions that he'd given them some time in advance. Was that an unusual thing? It was something of an unusual step. I mean, what was interesting about it was that the common refrain, the word that you saw again and again and again in these questions was evidence. Uh, what Walker was hunting for and what he wanted in this entire trial, which took, you know, over five months, uh, what he wanted was hard evidence. He wanted data, he wanted numbers, he wanted show of, of, of economic harm. And so this is something that he came back to again and again in these questions. And it was not a small number of questions. It was 37 in total. So they really had their work cut out for him. Mm. What, does either side seem better prepared than the other in addressing those? But they didn't get the same questions. No, there was, there was a roster of similar questions, and they each had a dozen each. It was like an episode of Jeopardy or something. But they, um, they, it seemed to me, at least in the courtroom, what was, uh, these questions were mainly set up to establish kind of a framework for their closing arguments. Mm -hmm. And in the courtroom on Wednesday, it seemed fairly clear to me that uh, the defense was really on the defense. I mean, there were a lot of very pointed questions about why they hadn't called more witnesses, why they hadn't brought up more evidence. Um, so if I was a betting man, I would say that the def defense was, was really on their heels. Mm -hmm. from, from what I've heard, I mean, it sounds like Judge Walker was really pretty critical of the defense's arguments. And I'm wondering, were there you know, if you had to pick an argument that seemed to hold up the best, the strongest, under that criticism, what was it? What, what seems to be their strongest card at this point? Well, it's, uh, that's, that's a good question because Walker seemed really dismissive of, of, of most of their arguments. And the central tenet of what they were trying to say was, look, uh, the, the institution of marriage is about one thing. It's about making babies. That's, what, that's all they seem to want to say. And they said that again and again and again. They said it during the trial and they said it in their closing. And Walker, without p pausing, was like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Basically said, what about people that are infertile? What about people that are past the age where they can have children? So in terms of the defense, if that was the card they were betting on, it's kind of a weak card. But Jesse, forgive me for leaping ahead here, but isn't this really ultimately going to wind up in the US Supreme Court? And is it going to hinge on what one swing vote say Anthony Kennedy thinks about all of this, yeah, not I mean, necessarily talking, Von Walker. In talking to Ted Olson, who is a smart guy and is new to the issue of same-sex marriage, but obviously spent a little time in front of the Supreme Court, you know, you ask him, you say, look, right now the composition of the Supreme Court, it leans slightly to the right, um, probably 5-4. He is very confident that he has that fifth vote. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Judge Kennedy. I think that that is the one they are counting on that. He has in the past sided with the liberal side on cases involving gay rights. Um, that being said, this is going to take a while. Um, I think Walker will probably give his decision eh, within, by the end of the summer. It will be instantaneously appealed. Mm -hmm. It will go to the Ninth Circuit. It may go directly to the Supreme Court. Are we but talking years? I think it's going to be a couple of years. Yes. I mean, he, he took four months, though, you know, from the time that the trial yeah. uh, testimony ended uh, to get to this point of hearing closing arguments. What? What? That's, is that on you? I think that was purposeful. I think that this is such a closely watched case. I think that so many, uh, you know, so many couples are hinging on this. It's being, it's being covered nationally, obviously. Uh, that he wants to be extremely deliberate about his decision. He wants this decision to be every, every I dotted, every T crossed. And I think that that was part of it. it you know, he had the two and a half week trial and they said, you know what, let's take a little while and I'm gonna think about these issues. He asked for briefs once, he asked for briefs again. He asked, he put out these questions that you mentioned. He wants to be extremely precise when he gives this decision because he knows it's gonna be parsed extremely closely. Mm -hmm. And is this, um, what's at stake here? I mean, ultimately, if this does wind its way all the way up, is it going to wipe same-sex marriage off and make it, you know, if, they, if the ruling goes against same-sex marriage and make it impossible for any of the states that do it to continue? Well, there's an interesting irony here. If, let's say, it does get to the Supreme Court, and let's say the Supreme Court says, you know what, the state of California is completely within their rights to set their own laws, and they reject uh, any challenge to Proposition 8. 
Then conceivably, if they were to take this to a vote, say in 2012, another vote on same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. and it were to pass, the precedent would have been set already that the states can make their own laws. So in a weird way, it could actually work to their advantage. Yeah, any, any word for the, I think, 19,000 or so, 18,000 people who were married during that one period when that was possible? Uh, did he indicate uh, at all what might happen? Well, he made a point. Uh, there had been a brief issued by the defense the morning of the, the uh, closing arguments where there seemed to be some suggestion that they were going to have Proposition 8 re be become retroactive. And this sent out this huge hue and cry in the, in the gay rights community that somehow they were trying to invalidate the 18,000 people who were married between May and November of 2008. Uh, so Judge Walker asked that question. He said, are you trying to have this, uh, these marriages invalidated? And the defense was very careful to say, no, 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 we absolutely do not have that opinion. So it's, it's unclear as to whether or not that was the intention, but right now those people seem safe. Mm -hmm. Well, we, you've been following a case, of course, as we said, that has drawn national attention in the courts, but uh, Amy, you've been working on a case that's just rising to the top of concerns, and uh, yours is a strawberry story. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and I want to say right <laughs> off the top, this is not not about strawberries not, that yes. are in the supermarkets right, right now. This is the first <laughs> question everyone asks. Does this mean I should not eat strawberries anymore? And this, the concern with this particular chemical, it's called methyl iodide, is really for it's about farm workers, um, not just about farm workers, it's also about people who live near strawberry fields. And in California, that's a lot of people. Um, strawberries are grown on the coast, people tend to live on the coast. You have all kinds of communities and schools and daycare centers that are right up against strawberry fields in towns like Monterey, Salinas, Watsonville. Um, so yes, this is a concern for those people's health. Well, strawberries are so plentiful, and they're yeah. more so so much more reasonably priced, it seems, of this season than we've yes. seen larger, bigger. Uh, is that because of what? I mean, well, I think that's probably because it's, this has been a good year for growing strawberries. I mean, strawberries, the way strawberries are grown right now is the way they have been grown for decades. And that's, I'm talking about conventional strawberries. That's grown using a fumigant. Um, it's a chemical called methyl bromide. And basically, this is something that farmers use to sterilize their soil before they put the strawberry plants in. Um, and what it does is it wipes out all the pests so that you put your plant in and you have a plant that is not competing with any bugs or mold or anything like that. You get twice as many strawberries if you use a fumigant. The problem is that methyl bromide damages the ozone layer and was essentially banned about 10 years ago. And it's taken strawberry growers that long to come up with an alternative. Uh, it's a $2 billion industry, and they say, we can't do it without this chemical, methyl iodide. Okay, but the but. alternative <laughs> yes, will exactly. do what to That's eat. the I huge mean. sort of butt of this story. On the one hand, you have a chemical that causes significant damage to the environment, the ozone layer. On the other hand, you have a chemical that is highly toxic. One of the scientists who consulted on this decision, who worked for the state, called it one of the most dangerous chemicals in the world. I mean, they, you know, very strong language you hear from Nobel prize winning scientists um, on the toxicity of this chemical. So it's of environment, farm workers' global, health. Global exactly. warming versus cancer, basically, is what More we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. When, when would this yeah. take effect? When, would, uh, when, when should I stop eating strawberries, really? Well, <coughs> you know, it, this all depends. I mean, we're back to lawsuits, really, right. you know, like, like your story. I mean, the next, we're, we're in right now the public comment period. So. By June 29th, you and anyone else can write a letter to the State Department of Pesticide Regulations saying, you know, don't use this chemical. Um, after that, it's up to the that agency to decide what, what to do with those comments. Uh, you know, no one's saying that this is a done deal, but the agency has never reversed itself before. Mm -hmm. They have never said they're going to approve something and then not approved it. Okay. So, but I think there's a, a lot of talk about lawsuits coming from environmental groups. And where do right. the farmers come down? Uh, the farmers say they need the chemical. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, you know, are you talking about farm workers or are you talking about farm owners? Farm I mean, owners, that's a big, yeah. the farm owners would say, we don't have a business if not for this chemical. It would take years to switch over to organic. It would mean the entire country would be spending $6 a basket. Talk a little bit more about the, 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 the pesticide we're talking about. Sure, okay, so methyl iodide is, um, like I said, it's a fumigant, so you inject it into the soil. It's very toxic. It's a carcinogen, like Jesse said, which means it causes thyroid tumors. It also causes uh, miscarriages. These are in animal studies on rats and rabbits. Um, it is also a neurotoxin, and the science on that is much more 
is sort of still still taking place. The great fear is that if you have a chemical that causes miscarriages, so affects the fetus, mm. and causes brain damage, surely there's a lot you're doing to that fetus before it actually dies. Um, this is it's grim stuff, but we're talking about changes in the developing brain that might take decades to be detected um, and that's that's and you, have, it's, you it's, don't know when we will know there was a hearing on Thursday there's a but hearing on Thursday we don't know what's gonna happen yeah. well we know what did happen in Berkeley in November <laughs> and that was that students were upset about an increase in fees that was proposed and they they let the authorities know that and that didn't go so well Boy, did they let them know. Mm -hmm. um, November 20th was a, very, was a pivotal day in the UC Berkeley and UC uh, year of protests. It was um, the day after the UC Regents approved um, a really an unprecedented 32% fee hike, bringing fees over 10,000, basic fees over $10,000 for the first time. But November 20th was not the first day of protest. Students had been protesting up and down the state on campuses since September. And there were a lot of clues that the day after this uh, regents vote, there would be trouble. What um, we have uh, that just came out is a rather extraordinary look back at the university's response, administrators and police leaders, and how they handled that day of protests and in a very eloquent 128 pages the uh, independent review said they did a horrible job mm -hmm. that's the and, leaderships and what, what they did why I mean, did they give a reason did they they uh, skewered really the police and the administration for not taking seriously the threat of uh, what, what happened on November 20th was that about 40 students took over a, a Wheeler Hall on the UC Berkeley campus. They barricaded themselves in and they opened the windows and they spoke to a crowd of about 2,000 students who ringed that building and they said, you know, we will not, this is our university, we're taking it over. And the police and the administration were shouldn't have been but were caught by surprise and they focused on those 40 students up there and forgot that there were 2,000 angry um, students in the rain may I add um, who were just as furious and angry as the people inside the building and the police the campus police were uh, un there were too few of them there was no real uh, administration in charge. I think in the morning they were having breakfast somewhere. Um, and this report looks back and says, all right, you know, the, the, these are the mistakes that were made. Well, well, I just bought this along because I, I thought it was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. About 40 years ago, a little more than that, the Berkeley campus was like the epicenter of student protests. And looking at a couple of headlines from the Daily Cal back, I guess that was about 1969. Uh, and uh, at that, on that particular day, 35 people were shot at Berkeley. Preceding that, the shot you saw was of a helicopter spewing tear gas. I mean, this is a school that's gone through it all and should know well how to handle student yeah, uprisings. You could say that the educators, the instructors didn't do their homework, you could say, but um, this was the, the birthplace of the free speech movement. Um, there wasn't as much violence on November 20th, uh, although it was a, it was described in the report as a dangerous confrontation. The um, police used batons and barricade, metal barricades, and they whacked students' uh, wrists, and, and somebody broke their fingers. A police officer was uh, out of work for months after a barricade came down on him. And so if you have this kind of history, then you really need to prepare. What if we have civil disobedience of this size? What if we have it of this size? And nobody had done so. Now, there mm -hmm. were protests in March over education cuts as well. Was there any indication that the, the UC had learned lessons out of this, that they, that they were not caught by surprise in March? I think they didn't need this 128 page report to realize that they needed to do something different. So by the time spring came around and there were a number of other protests, including a recent hunger strike, the um, administration, Chancellor Robert Burgenow, mm -hmm. had realized he needed to talk to the students a little bit more and set things in motion. 
and uh, things are in motion because there was another pay increase. Yes, <laughs> that's not a pay increase. I'm sorry, a, a, another fee hike increase. In fees. Yes. Not at UC, yeah. but at CSU, CSU, five percent today. All right. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight with very interesting stories.